Okay, looks like everybody's here. I'd like to thank everybody for showing up. And my name's Jack Rushlander, Eastern Technical Manager for Jurgens. Nate Perello is assisting me in the presentation. He assists me all the time uh, in, in our everyday endeavors. Um, what we typically do at Jurgens, in my capacity, is we look at customers' projects and it could be vertical, horizontal, it could be any, diff any type of machining application. And we gather the data, and in a relatively quickly manner, we have to come up with a solution, a proposed solution, we call it a concept. And um, I've been doing this for a long time, and I thought, well, it'd be pretty cool to share how we do that with customers and with people in, in, in the industry. So what you're about to see is by no means the way to do it, but it's how we do it. And we, we have to not miss anything if possible. We have to make sure that we present a viable solution. We have to make, you know, make sure that it's gonna work. So there are certain things that we look at and there's a certain sequence of how I approach something like this to try and make sure that that happens. So first of all, we can uh, get into the PowerPoint why five axis? And before we get into that, I'll just like to, everybody in the room is here for a reason. You must, either you have five axis machines or you're looking to purchase them and get into five axis machining. Let's have a real quick show of hands. How many, how many CNC programmers do we have in the room? Okay. And what about manufacturing engineers, guys who plan the whole thing? Okay, got a little few more of them. What about managers? You know, guys who just kind of tell everybody else to do it and walk around and make sure they do it right. We got any of them? Okay, we got lots of them. Okay. Pretty diverse audience, so I'll try and keep it pretty diverse. Well, five axis, I'm going to the next one. I want to talk about the pros real quick. A lot of people consider it the most versatile machining capability. You can hit all these sides, you can do ball end mill work. In fact, uh, sometimes five axis milling is synonymous with ball end mill 3D type work. But it's not always used that way. In fact, in the field, what I see most is people really using a five axis just to hit a bunch of sides of the part. And very, very seldom do I actually see true five axis 3D contouring. So I'm going to kind of, I kind of kept this, I only got 45 minutes, so I kept it sort of what I see as the norm out there in the field. You can tack all these sides. But really what, what I feel is the, is the most powerful feature, I guys learned how to use this thing, of five axis, is that you can create all datums at once sometimes, or you call them all the datums, you can call them important features, relative features, whatever you want to call it. But it gives you the ability to, create a lot more things at the same time that are dimensionally relative to each other. And that's really nice because these machines today are so accurate, you've got two tenths accuracy, and so if you can machine it all in one clamping, it's gonna make a lot nicer part. You can move on. Cons, we'll just go over them real quick. It's expensive, but just about everything is these days. You get, let's, less parts per cycle. I mean, think about that. Um, if, you, if anybody here has like a horizontal machining centers, the thing for years was, okay, I want to get a tombstones on the horizontal, and I want to put as many parts on each side of the tombstone as I can. I want to press that button and walk away for five hours. And we still do that. I mean, and that is still a very common occurrence. Uh, I don't think a week goes by that a customer doesn't say to me, I want you to get as many parts under the spindle as you can. And I know that that's, that's one of my goals. But on the five axis, because you have all these sides that you want to hit, you can't always get as many parts on there as you can with, say, a tombstone and just putting a bunch of parts. Because now you're only hitting three faces. You're hitting the front, side, side. That's all you got on them. Five axis programming is a lot more complicated. How many here in the room? have heard the word dynamic work offset before. Okay, 20 years ago, no one would have knew what that was. 
No one, no one knew what dynamic work offset was. You, you, but now, with all of this going on mathematically and moving this part around and rotating it and going at angles, if you don't have a computer keeping track of where your zero is, you, you really couldn't do it. When I got into the trade back in, right after the Civil War, it was um, all G code, all XYZ coordinates, I had to sit down and plot every single point because there were no CAM systems. Can you imagine programming a five-axis machine like that? I mean, you, you, you just couldn't do it. It just, it just couldn't be done. So that can, it can be intimidating to a lot of people. And it's like, boy, I got to do all this. I got all these sides going on at once. I got you know, all these zeros. I can't use zeros. I got to use dynamic work offset, all this stuff. It's intimidating for a lot of people. And it requires an increased skill level. Somebody who's good at this, it's pretty good. And we all know, if you're shop owners or managers, it's not that easy to find good people nowadays. They're not just beating the door down to get in. So what I wanted to do here was, was try and show you that it's really not, it doesn't have to be intimidating. It doesn't have to scare you away. It's, it's, and it can be a lot of fun. So now my beautiful assistant, Nate, here is going to move into the next screen. Process essentials, I want to go over real quick. And this, this holds to any process. I don't care whether it's five axis, three axis, a lathe, or whatever. You got to understand what you're making. And it helps sometimes to even know what it does. But I can't tell you how many parts I've, I've planned, programmed, and made, and I had no idea what it was. No idea. Someone says, what does this thing do? I don't know. Production requirements. What I mean by that is, how many do you have to make per day, per shift, per month, whatever? Your per, 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 what are your production requirements? Do you have to make 25 of these a shift? What kind of machine do you have to make it on? Sometimes you have to make something on a machine that you really, it's not the best machine, but that's what you have. So you have to use it. This is very important to find the raw material. I'll bet a week doesn't go by in my day-to-day -day work where somebody doesn't show me a print and say, I need to know how to make this, and they don't tell me what they're making it out of. And I'll say, well, what's the raw material look like? From a work holding standpoint, I'm holding the raw material, and I'm making that part. If this is all I got to hold, then we're done. I don't have to hold anything. It's already finished. So what is the raw material? What's the machining order of attack? How do you want to attack this part? Op one, op two, op three. And that's another thing while I say, it. nowadays it's not op one, two, three anymore, it's op 10, 20, 30. And I'm kind of old fashioned, so I say op one, two, three, so just bear with me on that one. We have to allow access to all the required machining. We're gonna spend some time in here talking about how we check for that and make sure that that's gonna happen. The work holding is critical. Naturally, I sell work holding, but a lot of people wait till the last minute to figure out the work holding. A lot of times I get involved in projects where it's like, hey, we, we need to start making these parts in, in 60 days. I need, to, I need to be shipping parts in a month. And when you get into these more complicated setups, five axis, and you get all this stuff, it's very difficult sometimes to pull off the work holding and get everything done in, a short, in what, what I consider a short amount of time. Get your processes down, understand the cutting tools you're gonna use, has to repeat within the accuracy requirements. Maintain quality. You have to maintain the process, meaning how often do the tools need change, things like that. Ergonomics. I focus a lot on ergonomics when I do a plan for work holding because I have discovered that if a project is not fun to work with, if it's kind of a pain loading parts and the guy has to do everything, after a while, it breaks down, nobody wants to run it, and you'll, you'll notice production lag in that area. So I always try and create a process that's fun to work with, if possible. So we can move on. So let's start off with the machine. And our pre this presentation and my method and Nate's method very much relies on the CAD system that you're using. We use our 3D modeling to simulate just about everything. And whether you're using SolidWorks, which we use, or you're using CATIA or SolidEdge or some other 
3D software, they all pretty much have the capabilities to do the things you're going to see Nate doing here today. So the first thing that I recommend people do is to model the work envelope of their particular machine. And this is just a, this thing here is a fictitious machine that we made up. It doesn't even exist. So we tried to make something that would kind of show for everybody. So we have like a five axis rotary table here. We even stuck a pillow block on it. But this is where I want you to pay the most attention is the travels and restrictions. This is absolutely critical to know what this is. And I recommend that you model this and you have something like this modeled in your computer, in your database, in your server, or wherever you want to put it, ready to go for each machine in your shop. So you're not sitting there doing this every time you plan a job. It has to be ready to go. Now, now we're going to talk about what are we making. We know what we're making it on now. We're making it on this machine. What are we going to make? Every project out there starts typically with a blueprint. If you're the manager guy over sitting over here, he gets a blueprint, and somebody sends him a request for quote, and it says, oh, okay, I want you to quote me 500 of these and price and delivery. That's pretty much what you get, 500 of these, price and delivery, and he has to figure out, okay, how am I going to do that? So he knows what he's making strictly by looking at a print. And then maybe somebody sends you something to quote, and you say, gee, I don't quite Can you send me a 3D model for this? How many people have ever requested a 3D model when they're going to quote something? So that's, that's nice to have, too. You don't always get it. So we're going to start here with what most people typically start with, and the part drawing. And the part drawing, and we're going to talk about some production requirements, and we'll see what, so you can move on, move on to, the, to the drawing now. Now we, now, we made this part up. It's a complete widget. Uh, I told Nate that, that to, he, was, he was free to come up with the name of a company and a part. So Nate called it Galactic Midget. Widget company, and it's this is a thingamajig. Okay, it doesn't exist. So you start looking at this print, and you start looking at it and say, okay, this is what I have to make. And right away, I'm thinking about what kind of raw material do I want. And sometimes it's already listed on the print, like this one is. Sometimes it isn't. Oftentimes, I go into a company, I'll say, what's your raw material? And they'll say, you're free to pick whatever you want. Oh, that's nice. Okay. But this one here, we know what we got. It's telling us we got 4140 pre-hard steel, inch and a quarter by inch and three quarter, sock cut to 4.13. So that's a pretty good description of the raw material. And this is the guy we're going to make. So what I'm going to look for now are things on this print that I look for that are difficult, more difficult than others. I look for things with like parallelisms, perpendicularities, concentricities, surface finishes, things. And, and some things are popping out at me when I look at this. And I kept this simple because I, I don't have as, done a lot of time here. But notice we got a plus one minus nothing on this diameter. And then here we have another plus one minus nothing on the location from the bottom of this part up to the center of this hole. Okay. Got a parallelism here of this surface the bottom of this pocket. So we got some things going on here. So what I typically do first is look at the part, understand my raw material, and make sure I got a picture in my head of what this thing looks like. And then I highlight areas of, areas of concern. I hate, to, I hate to use the word difficulty because I don't like to think of anything as being difficult. But if you can go to the next thing, and then I highlight them. And I say, OK, these, these, these are things that I want to really make sure that I do at the same time take extra care with. I want to I really make sure that this, these particular dimensions and, and, and criteria is being properly addressed in my process. And, that, and so you go, I, use, I use highlighters a lot. I have in my desk yellow, green, red, pink, all kind of colors. And I go through and I highlight things. So we can move on to the next one. So we identified the raw material. And this is something I definitely recommend. And what the way we do it is I like, I take the finished part and I put it in the raw material and I make the raw material like transparent. And you can see right away, okay, this is what I'm making. 
and this is what I'm making it out of, and I can, you can bring that up if you have, you can rotate around, so okay, I have stock everywhere, and notice that where we put a little more stock on the top, and you'll see why here in a minute, but we kind of situate it exactly the way it's gonna be in the raw material. Create the 3D model as it will be presented to the machine, and create an assembly within the raw material and make the raw material transparent. So we can move on to the next one now. Now, how many people here have used the machine a dovetail first method for five axis machining? Were you machine a dovetail? Okay, we're talking, I talk, I wanna break off and talk a little bit about that right now. Um, if you're not familiar with this method, I didn't see too many hands. Um, you could stop by our booth, and we have an example of that, or probably you could stop by a lot of the uh, work holding people and you'll probably see somebody, other people doing it. But what the, 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 the plan, the idea with this dovetail, and I see people using dovetails when they really didn't, wouldn't need them, and I see people not using the dovetail when they probably should. So let's just talk real quick. I'm gonna, if anybody that can't see this, I'll try and do it big, but like if you have a set of, of dovetail, like a, like a dovetail vise, or we're, I'm just gonna say, make it like it's a set of dovetail jaws, okay? And then I'm gonna put a part in there. Say that's the part, okay? The main reason that you use a dovetail is really so you, it's, the part doesn't, it's not gonna move and you can, you can hold on a very small amount of, of material on the bottom, and this thing is not gonna move. So the, the taller the part gets away from the jaws, the more important it is that you have, that you use this dovetail. If the part's really not that tall, a lot of times you can just use serrated grippers or something else and the part's not gonna move anyway. You can kind of create something and do the same thing. And the nice thing about that is you're eliminating that front operation. You're not gonna have to machine that dovetail as an op one and you're gonna go straight to machine your part. But just because most people use the dovetail, I incorporated a dovetail into my I like, I like to make the dovetail as big as I can, okay? I'm like, I'm not, I'm not gonna put a little dovetail in here like this if I don't have to. My question is, if you have a very tall shape, like how tall is it, how tall must it be once you mandate a dovetail? I would probably, it really depends on what, how you're gonna, what kind of aggressive machining you're gonna do to it. But like probably if I'm, if I'm in a vise and I'm probably going up higher than about two, two inches, I'm using a dovetail, two, three inches. Does that, I don't know if that answers your question. I, am, I do have a 15 minute question at, at the end. So I would ask you to keep your questions till the end. But uh, I can address that to you if you wanna come up later, we can talk about that personally. It's, it really depends on how aggressive you're gonna attack this thing. Because that's another thing. Um, if you're, you could have a real short piece and small, and you might want to use a dovetail simply because you plan on really ripping material off that thing. And you want, I want this thing in a dovetail because I want to just rip this thing. I want to go 40,000 RPM and 180 inches a minute and I'm going to take the cake cuts. And that's, you know, that's another reason to use a dovetail. So a lot depends on not just how tall it is, but how aggressive you're going to attack it. Now notice that the, now in dovetail vices, if you go to a dovetail vise, they're usually a particular size. The dovetail vise is designed to hold a particular size dovetail, where dovetail jaws will open and close and you can hold different size dovetail. And once again, if you stop by the booth, I'll show you examples. Um, so let's go back to our part now and model each operation. Now here we have what's gonna look like after op operation one with the dovetail, then over on the right, Nate has the finished part. So, he created a 3D model reflecting, and now we're gonna start getting into some color coding. So move on to the next, okay. So, these are all models that I recommend that you have created up front. Raw material, all by itself. This is what it's gonna look like when it's done with operation one. 
Then you're going to flip that over and hold on the dovetail, and you're going to create operation two. Then you're going to flip that over and finish the part. Now, if you look at how we're doing this, all of back, and if we went back to that print with the red on it, we're creating the features that are relative to each other at the same time. So here, like this bore is being created at the same time this face. Remember that, remember that had to be a close tolerance from this face down to that bore? So we're going to do them together. Then we're going to flip it over, and we're, doing, we're going to create this face and this pocket in the same clamping so that we're guaranteed to get that parallelism that, that we wanted on the print. So every, all of the important, critical, difficult things on that print are being addressed in the way that we're attacking this part. So now we can move on to the, to the next one. I like to color code the part surfaces and features based on your operation. If you're going to have three operations, you'll have three colors. And that way you can always look at your model and say that, no, by looking at that part and looking at the color, you know exactly what operation it's being created in. And you'll come sometimes look at it and say, whoa, I don't want to do that in that operation. I want to do that in the other operation. So you might have to go back to the drawing board all the way and figure out how you're going to do this thing so that everything gets made in the proper sequence. Go on to the next one. Now, here's where you're going to insert your color-coded operation assemblies into the work envelope. Now, we're going to bring that work envelope in that we talked about earlier and put that into our layout, and, conf and we're going to start looking at things like access and how it's going to be presented to the machine tool. So we can move on to the, we start out with a work envelope, and Nate's going to start bringing things into it. Is he so the first thing he's going to bring in, and what we're going to do here is we're going to, I'm going to show you some, some features that every CAD system has that you really want to learn how to master. And probably most of you that are doing this already do this, but perhaps you don't, so we're going to spend a few minutes here. A lot of times when people are assembling things and bringing them in, they bring them all, and in fact, if you want to try and hold six pieces or eight pieces, they bring them all in, and they try and assemble them and mate them, and it just takes a lot of time. So I just want to do a real quick thing on how to use um, the patterns, and how we use this to, to test for things. So just, just present that thing like you're, like you're, we're just going to do it in a simple way, like pretend it's on a horizontal even. Present it to me right on the face. Now show me the face as if the operator were opening the door. Okay, the operator opens the door. Now, note that this red area, and let's talk about the red area here, and this is kind of fictitious. We don't, like I say, this is a machine that we just kind of made up, and I put this red area in because a lot of machines have a dead zone. They have a dead zone of where you, your y-axis can start machining. So that represents the dead zone. So... Look at it from the top, Nate. Let's see what it looks like from the very top down. Okay, bring that thing over to the edge. Now, that's the edge of the trap. Okay, st stop it right there. Now, let's just see, and this is what I want to show you. How do you let's just see how many of them we can fit around there. Let's just go back to the old, how many can we get on my machine? So, let's do a rotation around the center of that pallet of that particular setup and see what we can get. Start off with just a four-sided, like, like a four-sided, like your typical tombstone type setup. Okay. I see all he did was select that assembly and rotate it around four times. Let's try five. See what it looks like with five. Okay, that's good. Let's try that. Go back to the face like I'm, like I'm loading it. We can get more than that on. I don't think you're going to be able to fit three, but try and fit three patterns of that up. Now, he's taking each assembly, he's grabbing those patterns, and he's moving them and rotating them up the plane, and he's going to, okay, I don't think we're going to get three. We're going to be out of our envelope. But, okay. Since we can only put two in there, nah, I don't want three. Let's go to two. 
And since we can only put two, let's give the operator ample room to get the vice handle in, move the up a little bit, and then move the whole pattern up, all, everything, so we're out of the red zone completely. Get it up nice. Okay, that looks good. Now show them an isometric view of what that would look like, just kind of, there you go. So you see how fast we took apart, and just by manipulating the CAD system, we just said, okay, look, this is how we can do this, and we can get this all in there. So I, I recommend everybody learn how to do that with your particular CAD system, be it SolidWorks, Katia, or whatever it is, because it's, I don't, I don't, a lot of people start with the work holding and then put the parts on it. I like to start with the parts, make, let's see how I want to attack them, and then I'll put the work holding in later, figure it out later. Oh, I want a, I want a five-sided tombstone for this one. So now we can go back into our normal, our job that we're looking at. And so has anybody been using method like that when you do your layouts? Okay. Okay. Something's, uh-oh, we got a problem here. Solid works died. So we practiced this how many times and this never happened? Okay. Anyway. So I don't know how long. But, um, so how many people have actually done that with their CAD systems, where you actually do one and then you just move it around? And you can go to the top and you can drag it and you can see how big it'll take. So we'll see how fast Nate can do this. He's faster than me. You back in there? Okay, I think we're good. Are you back? Okay, so you can see that he brought in a pyramid fixture. Some people call this a flower fixture. I've seen it called a fa I've seen it called faceted work holding, which is quite impressive. But it's basically a lot of five-axis machines. It's, it's not, uh, you can put this type of a fixture on there, and it allows you to put multiple parts on, and still hit all five sides of the part if the part is small enough and will fit. So what we're going to do here is show you like with the part that we talked about and we're doing. He's got operation one where we're creating a dovetail. And that's a high, he's got the high part in there. But, uh, and now make that transparent so we can see. Um, okay, so there's the dovetail. Now notice that the dovetail has the slot in it. And, you, and uh, anybody that's done five axis knows that dovetail vices have a little pin in them. And that pin allows you to position the part in only one way. It's a foolproofing method. So you can put it in the dovetail vise and not put it in the wrong way. So go ahead and bring up operation two. Okay. And then operation two is gonna turn into operation, we're gonna do the machining on operation. There it goes, so now the machining's done. Now we'll bring in, and that's being done in the dovetail vise. So this created feature here flips over, goes into the dovetail vise, you then create this, now you can go ahead and bring in Bring in operation three. And now we finished off the part. Boom. And I wish we could all machine that fast, but we got it all machined now. Put the raw material in, put the dovetail on, put the dovetail in. We made off one, put off one in, made off two, and, and, er, and everything's done. Now let's, now let's look at things like, actually, move on to the next. Um, where we were talking about um, access, okay? This is where you want to check for things. What, what you don't want to happen is when you're out there on the machine and all of a sudden you discover that your spindle nose is going to crash into something or your tool's not protruding far enough from a holder. So I just kind of did an example here where he said, okay, well, this is something here. I'll test him for this one. He's put it, we modeled a spindle and he, Nate likes to model coolant, anything that might be in the way, we kind of have that there. And though, so we check and say, okay, I don't see any problem here. So let's look at some, let's look at some other area now. Say we're, I look at this and I said, well, you know, I'm worried about reaming that hole. I'm worried about coming through that bore on the side. And you, you machinists and guys out there, well, you'll, you'll know when you look at this stuff where the potential problems might be. So I say, okay, I wonder if that's going to make it. So we model that, and he's going to bring that reamer down in there, 
and then we're going to find out real quick that he's going to crash because it's not going to work. So what do we got to do? That means we just have to, we have to extend our, either extend the reamer a little bit, we have to get a long tool holder. But what I, my, my point is to take the extra time to 3D model certain, you don't have to, don't have to do all your tools. You only have to do tools that you feel could be a problem. Have them modeled, bring it in, check it here. Find out here if it's going to be a problem. Because what you don't want is the operator coming into your office and saying, hey, man, I just smashed it in the machine and I, you know, I trashed a $20,000 spindle. Find the problem here. So now we can move on. Now he's got a longer tool. Put the longer tool in there, and the longer tool will definitely make it down in there, and everything's okay. Nothing's hitting anything. So there it is sticking out the bottom. There's no problems here. Problem solved. And we solved it all. We identified it here, and we solved the problem here so that when it gets to the shop floor, there are no problems. So we can move on to the next one. So model, model questionable cutting tools confirm access. Put the, put the tool in the holder. Include the spindle nose, coolant area, and position the models in the worst possible condition. Be a devil's advocate. You have to look for what might happen. Go on to the next one. Once it is confirmed, all features can be completed and all tools have access. Bring in the work holding and place it so material areas can be attacked. We did that, closely analyzed and confirmed. And you may have to adjust your plan. It's a lot easier to adjust your plan here than after it's being set up on the shop floor and you're, you're trying to get production out. So we can move, go ahead. Kind of a review here. Am I creating features in good relation to each other? Does it look like it'll be rigid? And I just ask, I mean, how, how many guys out here can, you, can just look at something and tell you it's not going to be rigid? I mean, like, right there, it's like, people show me things all the time. They say, what do you think of this? And I'm like, you know, I think it's going to sing like the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, okay? I'm just being honest with you. And I say, oh, yeah, I was kind of worried about that. So now's the time to look for that. Where might there be issues? Tool wear, chatter, concentricity, flatness, true positions, any other close tolerance features. You want to look, is this, am I pulling everything off the way I want to? Is this thing going to be attacked and made the way I want it to? What about chip evacuation? I like to talk about that. So many people come up with a fixture or a design or a process thinking that it, everything out there in the shop is just as clean as that solid works. It's not, okay? There's chips everywhere, and they will find every crack, crevice, nook, cranny that they can, and they'll be in it. So, you have, so look at every design that you come up with with the model and say, and kind of visualize what would happen if I threw a bucket of chips on this thing? Where would they go? Can they be evacuated? And, there are, and it's, it's definitely something you want to look at in your setups. There are a lot of things out there you can do. You can, you can change your feeds and speeds a lot of time just to make the chip a different structure. You can take long string, stringy chips and make them break faster. A lot of times slowing things down isn't the answer. Speeding up your feed rate creates a thicker chip. It falls away better. You can have these, they've got propellers now that like, look, makes a tool look like an upside down helicopter that blows the chips away. They have tooling coolant balls. We, we, we have one in our booth, if you, I mean, you want to see it, where it calls up and high pressure coolant comes out and just blows the chips off. Think about chip evacuation. Here's one. Is there a possibility of loading it incorrectly? The largest crash I ever had in my life when I was a young, a young buck, trashed a $15,000 spindle because I put a part in backwards. Didn't even think of it. Uh, I was operating horizontal. It was a Toyota. It was a big Toyota, 16 pallet pool machine, and I was bored. I was doing whatever, and I was loading parts, and all of a sudden, it, it just sounded like the end of the world, and it pretty much was. Um, loading it incorrectly. So there's a lot of things you can do. You look at your whole design, you get and say, you know what? I can load that backwards. I can load that two different ways. So that means you're going to have to design some kind of a little something in there, a, a, a pin or some sort of a device or a feature that's going to make it impossible to put it in the wrong way. 
Now's the time to see that. Will this be nice to work with? Just kind of look, sit back and look at it. And the reason I say that is people tend to fall in love with their designs. Okay, this is my design. It's my creation. It's like telling an artist that his painting's not that good or telling somebody that uh, they have an ugly daughter. You don't tell somebody they have an ugly daughter. They're the most beautiful thing. My, my, my daughter's the most beautiful girl in the world. I don't care what you say about her. So where somebody else can look at this and see something, where will Murphy's Law most likely show up? I ask, just look at this thing and say, what could possibly go wrong? You go back and you look at that whole setup all modeled up in the work envelope and you're looking at this thing. So what we want to do now, Nate, go back to, the, to, the, to our setup in the work envelope. And there's something in this there's something in here, once he puts the work envelope here, and I did this on purpose because here we are all done and we think it's the most beautiful thing in the world, but there's something here that's not, not, that I don't like. Does anybody see anything that may be weird? See this hole right here? If you tilt that up, He's going to have, it's, it's, out of, it's in the dead zone. It's going to, see that? We're in the dead zone there. So we got this thing whole, all done, and we think it's great, and it, we're, we're not going to be able to get to that hole because it's not going to be able to go in there. So I just wanted to show that where we would, you know, Nate's going to have to put a riser in there. We, so we get this whole thing done, and we're like, oh, we're going to have to rise this thing up a little bit. And there's a lot of ways you could do that. You could take each vice and raise it up. You could put a riser underneath of the pyramid. And I'm not sure if Nate has something like that planned, but he's pretty fast. So I just wanted to point that out, that take that second look at it and look at it in that manner. You can go back to the PowerPoint now and see where I'm at. And this is working out pretty good. Go to the next one. Once you think everything will be great and you think you have it all figured out and you're on top of the world, get somebody else to look at it. Like these two guys here work together, you get to do a job, you get it all planned, let this gentleman look at it. And don't be insulted if he finds something that's bad. That's another thing in this, in this trade is you, if somebody points out something, you know, thanks a lot. You got to thank them. You did me a favor. Get somebody else to look at it. Get that second opinion because you can fall so in love with your design that you won't see something that will just stick right out to somebody else. Have them look at it. They'll say, "Well, you're you're not going to have any travel here. You're going to it's not you're not going to be able to do that." So you can move on to the next one. Once everyone is happy and everybody likes it, you can send it to the programmer. Now, a little bit on this one. I really recommend um, if you're in a situation where you're say a manufacturing engineer or programmer and you plan the job completely, and you did all this, and you think it's right, and you had the second opinion, but you're not the one that's going to set it up and make it run. Maybe that's going to be this guy here. Say so he's, he's going to go in there and make it run. And he's never seen this before. You're asking for trouble. I always, always, if I can do it, I include the setup man in that process at the end where we critique it. The guy that's going to set it up. Most of the time he is involved, but I really recommend that you get him involved because if he buys into it, he'll make it work. But if he was never shown it, and he had not anything about it, and all of a sudden he's expected to turn this beautiful vision into a reality, he doesn't have the, he's, he, has, he doesn't really care if it works or not sometimes. So I highly recommend anybody that is instrumental in pulling this thing off, bring them into a little meeting, bring them into conference room, have a Teams meeting, whatever, say, okay, guys, here's my plan. What do you think? Does anybody see anything here where, that I missed? And you get everybody say, yeah, that looks good. That looks great. It'll usually go pretty good because they'll make sure it does. So we can go on to the next one now. And now is the time, if anybody has any questions for me, now's the time to ask them. If, um, I don't have any uh, 
there's no questions, I do have some things we can show. I, I can't really hear you, but whatever he said. Okay. You can't hear me? I can't, I, no, I can't hear. Oh, okay. You already answered my question. I was just... Okay. Yeah. I have a couple examples that I put together. Ooh, that's my Papa Smurf picture. My, grand, <laughs> my granddaughter looked at that and said, you look like Papa Smurf, Pap, so I went down to a goatee. So go, go to those e-drawings that I put in the folder. We'll just start with the first one. X, go, go, go with example. Well, I had them one, two, three. Yeah, go to example one. Okay. I just wanted to show some examples of some five axis, some strange five axis things that I've done. Oh, it's doing that on you. Yeah, there you go. Now, here's an example. We'll just show this one since it came up. Here's an example of somebody. And this is, these are examples based on things I've done for customers, where a customer got this brilliant idea. He was going to put three vices on a pyramid, and he told me what he wanted to do, and I said, I don't think it's going to work. So I did this layout for him. You see how the vices smack in the center, and it doesn't work. So I, I did the layout. I pulled it up. I put it on the pyramid, and I sent the guy the picture and said, you know, I'd love to sell you all these vices, but it's not going to work. It's not going to fit in your machine, because look at the top view. If you look at the top view, you, you see that it's right in there. He, there's no more room. I can't fit this. This guy's machine was too small. I just couldn't do it. But he, I mean, he would have went out and bought all this and got it in and tried it on a machine and wouldn't have been able to do it. So see if you can open up one of them other ones without any problems. And it's not working, Nate. I know. We didn't. What was the picture that you showed on the left hand of the screen that was two vices that were opposing each other on earth? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get that one up. I'm trying to get the example one up there right now. Okay. This, is, this, isn't, this was actually done, uh, something I did for a guy, and where he wanted, on a small five axis, he wanted to put a, a, a five axis vice on each side. So I come up with that strange looking apparatus and we mounted vices on there for, for this customer. And that's one of those ones where you look at it and say, I don't know how rigid that's gonna be. Remember, is anybody looking at that? But that's, but that's what, what he wanted. And so I just, and I just did a concept and I said, okay, here's how we could do this for you. And it's just a concept. So I can move on to the next one now. Why does that do that, Nate? I know why this is. It's because I have two monitors at home, and this one normally shows up on the left monitor, and this one shows up on the right. Click. Anyway, okay, here's an example of a five-axis setup where a customer wanted um, a rail system with a, like an okay vice type thing in the middle, and he wanted to do it on a five-axis. And there we're putting on a dovetail. One side we put the dovetail on, next side we do the part, and so we got operation one and operation two all in one setup. So I just wanted to show you another example. And all of this layout, everything that you see done here was done in the manner that I just showed you, where we model the machine, we model the envelope, we model the part, we model the stock, I put it in there, and I think I probably created that whole thing in an hour. And then I shut it, and then I put a picture together, and I'll, I'll either have a Teams meeting or I'll show it to the customer. What's your go-to material for that riser, that custom riser? What's that? Um, 
Well, I did this so long ago, I can't remember the material, but I probably um, got the material from the customer of what he's using. It's probably what I did for the material. But as far as like the go-to material for the part or the go-to material for the fixture? For the fixture. Oh, my go-to material for fixturing is 4140 per yard. Okay. That, it, that's usually what I start with in my head if to, to build like to build like the gray part there. Yeah, I would probably use like a 4140 pre hard. But I could also use aluminum if, if my machining is not going to be that heavy and I'm not worried about rigidity. I, I might go to I might use like a 6061. Sometimes 70-75 if I want something a little bit, little bit tougher. Can you but. help me understand the pre-hardened aspect of that? Because wouldn't it be harder to make this if it was already hard? Wouldn't it be more difficult to make this if it was already I don't think, no, I'm not, I don't think so. I, I like machining pre-hard. It gives you a nice finish. It's okay. stable. It doesn't move around too much. Okay. You know, I, I, I like 4140 pre-hard. I don't, definitely don't want cold roll. I mean, you machine that thing out of cold roll, it's going to like, you know, it's going to move all over the place. You know, if, if I was going to do something soft, I'd probably go with like an A30, like an A36 or 8620. Maybe I might go to hot roll, even hot roll. But I, I like 40, I like 4140 pre hard. See what, see, see if we can get. I don't know why these e drawings aren't coming up very nice. I apologize for that. But where are we at here? Any more you think? Okay. Here's an example. It's. Uh, of, you, of turning, making basically, this is kind of a neat one. This is a wedge. And actually, uh, this one here goes up and down. And you can, you can adjust the size of this if you want to by moving this up or down. But then this is where you put your part. And this uses an OK vise and turns it into a pyramid. So this, this is all custom. This is all custom risers. This is not custom. And this is a gripper. So these are some components that we sell, and I use those components in a totally custom manner to make a three-sided pyramid using OK Vice. Um, we can move on to the next one if I have it. Is there anything else? And another, OK, here's another interference. I think, Nate, did you finally figure something out? OK. OK, here's one where I just wanted to show you. This is an engine block. Uh, this is, that, the part's not important. Look at it from the top. Customer sent me this fixture and said, you know, hey, can you make me an ad adapter for my five-axis machine? And the first thing I did was put it on. See, see how the corners stick out of the work envelope? So I had to tell the guy, you know, this fixture's not going to fit on there very well. So flip up on the front, and you'll see on the bottom, Nate, on the bottom of the fixture. You know, like we had it, I was gonna set it up for a ZPS for one of our zero point systems and, and I told the guy, well, yeah, we can do this, but you're gonna have to modify your fixture a little bit. So by using this, and you, you can make that disappear. I don't really like to show customer parts, but I mean, it's an engine block, so an engine block's an engine block. But anyway, the, what, what I wanted to show there is that by using the techniques I showed here, real quickly, I could say this fixture is not going to go on your machine. You're going to have to go back to the drawing board here. And you're going to have to come up with a different fixture or change some things, cut your corners off. We're going to have to do something here. So I just wanted to um, illustrate how these types of techniques show up every day in our, in our business. So where are we at here? For in this, i got 10 minutes left. So. We ask, everybody's got this valuation here in front of you. If you could take some time to fill that out. And if you have any questions, um, I'll be here. I'll also be in our booth. Uh, booth number 432154 is our booth number. And um, I'll be there. If you want to talk to me personally on anything, feel free to stop in, say hello. Anybody else have any questions or any words of wisdom for me before we? Okay, well, th thank you all for showing up. I hope you got something out of it, and someday I'll see you in your shop. <laughs>